Right then, um, good afternoon everybody. Great to see you all again for uh, session four of the Intermediate Vegetable Seed Saving course. Um, this session is focused on cultivation. Um, before we begin, I'm afraid you have to listen to me go through the housekeeping rules again. If you could ensure that you're all on mute while the speakers are speaking, that would be much appreciated. And this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our Turvey Cymru channels and posted on the Knowledge Hub in the next few days. If you do have any concerns regarding this, please do email me and please feel free to turn your cameras off and alter your name um, being shown if you wish. Um, as with all sessions, please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions as we go along. Um, so this session is being led by Katrina Fenton, the head of the Heritage Seed Library, but before, um, and I like to hand over to Katrina. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this cultivation session. Um, I have my colleague Claire, who's a horticulturalist um, for the Heritage Seed Library in the background, although I think she may be having some difficulties connecting. So I'll lead on the webinar. And if there are any questions that I can't answer, I'll get back to you um, with Claire's response um, later on. So. Today, we're going to be getting through quite a lot of material. Um, the good news is we have a toolkit resource coming out. So hopefully shortly it will be on the website. So all of the content that I'll be covering this afternoon, there'll be signposts and links in the toolkit resource and for you to go back and have a look at. And the second half of this session, we're going to be looking at some cultivation requirements for some specific crops. Um, hopefully covering some of the ones that you're already growing or considering growing, namely peas, French beans, tomatoes, and uh, the cucurbit family. Um, we will be looking at other crops, obviously, ac across the course of the um, webinars, for the upcoming webinars, but we have included a, a Q&A session at the end, so obviously we can talk about some of the crops that you're already growing and look at what we need to do. First half of the session, I'm going to be looking at um, Again, similar to the previous two sessions, some general principle approaches um, to cultivation. And uh, for those of you who have joined on previous um, webinars, you'll know that we keep referring back to two, two key principles when we're growing for seeds. One is to prevent cross-pollination, and one is to uh, rogue out any um, varieties, any plants that are not typical and only save seed from the very best examples. What we're going to do on this session really is kind of expand that a little bit further. So we know that successful cultivation for seed is all about providing the optimum conditions to maintain seed quality. So I'm going to be looking a little bit at that, namely uh, looking at healthy seed crops, reiterating some of the principles about giving them the best growing conditions. I'll be introducing some of the key pests and diseases that we, we tackle where we won't be able to cover them all, but will give you a general feel for our approach to managing pests and diseases. We'll be looking at record keeping, very important part of um, your cultivation year for seed production, and um, particularly looking at the way you manage um, pest and disease management and recording what happens during the year. And we'll be touching briefly on storage um, and also testing, but all under the notion of seed quality. So why is it important? Uh, well, obviously, you, you are all aspiring seed producers um, of various scales. And uh, what we want is to ensure that we give you all the information you need to produce quality seed, um, because that's about your reputation, that's about your reliability of your seed stocks and your customers and your future distribution of seed. Um, and we know it's important um, because uh, good seed is going to produce high germination rates. It's going to store for longer, so you're going to be able to build up your seed stocks, uh, and it's going to produce healthier plants, and that kind of resilience that you need um, to overcome pests and diseases um, throughout. So we're talking really about the seed in your hands, either at the start or at the end of this process. And uh, for us, seed quality is really important to organic horticulture. You want the right seed, the right inputs, uh, and the right standard of seed that you produce at the end of it. And in general, the, the fatter the seed, the, the more heavier, the more mature the seed, um, the better the quality of the seed that you're going to be producing. So we'll talk you through some of the, the, the cultivation requirements to get you to the best um, seed 
at, at the end of this process. Um, as well as looking at quality of individual seed, we also describe seed stock purity. And that's also um, about quality because we're looking at what uh, percentage of pure seed you have in proportion to everything else that you may um, be producing. Um, so we're talking about parts of seed, parts of your seed stock that's unviable, um, seeds that without seed coat, uh, removing debris such as soil um, and, and any, any other kind of weed seeds that you might have that could contaminate your seed stock uh, or any underside seeds. And this is really important because I'm going to signpost you to to AFA at this point, and it may well be that um, Katie and the rest of the team um, will be introducing more on the seed regulatory side of things um, and the seed health side of things as part of the process of, of um, these webinars under the, the Sippy Cymru programme. Um, but for us, um, as a charitable organisation, a charitable conservation organisation, uh, we're working slightly differently. So it's important for you as commercial um, seed growers that you're aware of AFA as your friend, as your uh, organisation that's going to be able to support you through some of these seed stock quality um, requirements that you have for commercially produced seed. Um, we have had seed in our collection that we've uh, sold on previously. And when that's happened, we've had to go through, through some specific stages. Um, we register with AFA, obtain a licence to market our seed. We've had our growing site inspected by EFA once a year, and we provide um, samples of seed to test for purity, including um, levels of inert substances in them, um, as well as um, checking that the seed itself um, grows into the varieties as described. So how can we produce good quality seeds? Well, we've, we've already talked about uh, in previous webinars, the importance of things like population sizes to ensure that we've got genetically healthy seeds, but cultivation is going to be an extremely important part of um, producing quality seed. And we've already touched on some of these areas, so I'm going to briefly go through them. Uh, how are you going to find out how knowledge about your site? Um, you need to know about its growing conditions, the seed crop requirements that you have. Uh, and we looked at some of this in our planning webinars. So uh, do you have sufficient space for the population size you need? Can you accommodate the growing season required um, to produce the seed to full maturity? Uh, do you have any cross protection requirements at the beginning and end, uh, beginning of your growing season? And do you have any uh, weather requirements that you need to manage when you're trying to dry your crop at the end of the season? Uh, obviously, you want to give your growing season the best start, um, so only so from best quality seed. Uh, and when we're talking about looking at the seed in your hand when you start up this process, you're looking for only sowing seed that's really um, in good condition, removing any that have got slits, uh, any water damage from the seed coat. And we'll talk a little bit later about pest and disease issues that you might want to be considering at this point. Soil and health fertility. Again, we had a look at uh, crop rotations in the last um, session. And it might be that uh, you want to invest in some soil testing kits to make sure that your, your um, soil is, is healthy and has the sufficient nutrients for the kind of crops you're growing. And of course, you need to consider things like uh, water and temperature issues around um, your growing year. We know if you're using polytunnels, for example, um, high temperatures will affect um, pollen quality and the ability for you to produce seed. And of course, uh, we also touched on uh, making sure that you've got sufficient air circulation in your crops, making sure that you um, manage things like a weed cover so that you um, know that, uh, that you'll have sufficient space to grow your seed. Now, there's a huge range of pests and disease. Um, and in this time that we've got for this afternoon, we're not going to be able to cover all of them. But what we thought we would do would be in, to introduce some of the uh, typical pests and disease that we encounter in our growing year and give you some uh, um, approaches to, to manage them. Um, and in general, general pests and diseases are going to weaken your, uh, your plant and consequently the um, amount of seed that you can actually produce and also the quality of the seed that you're going to produce. And uh, you might want to consider building up a, a kind of reference library, as it were, or reference materials 
um, of, of uh, the kinds of pests and diseases you can expect to encounter the types of crops that you've got. Um, the RHS, for example, is a good website for that. We obviously have our own resources online on our site, um, and it may um, we've been signposted to some of the links in our toolkit for you to look at. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go through a few of the examples of, of uh, variety of issues that we encounter. Um, Moulds and fungi, they can be problematic um, at the end of the season if they're damp conditions uh, as your seeds are drying. And uh, sclerotinia, for example, um, that can thrive also in unventilated conditions. So if you're growing in polytunnels um, or under isolation cages, you need just need to um, uh, look out for that because that can seriously affect um, your developing pods. Things that can help reduce that risk include um, in making sure that there's plenty of air circulating around your plants and around your developing pods, including removing leaves at certain point, points of the year. Um, and we'll look at some examples of that with the French beans uh, cultivation later on. Obviously, good hygiene generally is helpful, making sure that you remove any infected stems uh, and make sure that you uh, completely remove everything from the soil. Similarly, botrytis um, and mould. On, on lettuces, for example, can see an issue, or on your brassicas, so making sure that you pull back um, the le lower leaves when you're producing seed on lettuce plants and making space for emerging um, seed stalks, for example. Moths and caterpillars, particularly an issue for us at the Heritage Seed Library because we use a lot of polytunnel growing. And of course, if you have uh, an outbreak of any of the inside your tunnels, um, it, you don't have any of the um, predators to remove them. So we do a lot of hand picking of um, uh, caterpillars that we find. Obviously, you're going to try and prevent that by covering them um, as soon as you can. Um, and we will be talking about pea moth and how you, your sowing timings can actually improve um, preventing um, pea moth from occurring. Um, but you do need to, to keep an eye out for these, and we'll be signposting you to some of the issues, um, some of the um, uh, solutions that we have via our, our um, toolkit resource. Uh, pea and bean weevil, again, that's something that you may notice with your seed, either before you sow or after you've harvested it. And you might notice them, um, they develop small holes in your beans. These are caused by the bean weevil and um, they will lay their eggs in the pod. Larvae will burrow into the developing seed and uh, they will emerge. They mostly feed on the cotyledon and um, the sort of embryonic leaf part of the seed. And we find that often in terms of your own use for seed sowing, that won't have a devastating effect on the seed itself. You can re-sow, but obviously if you're producing seed, the last thing you want to do is to be distributing seed that's been damaged in this way. So we would always recommend you remove all traces of any beetles that you can find. Uh, you can freeze the seed for seven days and that will um, kill off anything that's within the seed that hasn't already emerged, uh, as long as you make sure that the seed is dry enough. And after you have frozen, that you dry it off further before you store the seed. Um, in terms of um, uh, biocontrols, um, for other issues that you might have, so for something like um, scarid fly that you might find in the soil, and it's often the case with some of the um, untreated organic compost that we use, um, you will you can actually use nematodes and um, mites uh, within certain temperature conditions that will help um, to uh, help um, eradicate those kinds of pests. And again, you need to think about things like aphids and sap sucking insects that will also weaken your plants. Um, and also transfer viruses. So we also use hand, hand picking, hand squashing, and later bean larvae as well. Again, details of this, because this, this is quite a big subject, we've signposted in the toolkit resources for you. Uh, and finally, we do have to also factor in things like rodents, uh, big or small, uh, because they will uh, take a fancy to some of your biennial crops, whether they're in the ground or outside the ground. Uh, and things like board beans, et cetera, at the start of the year. So we use a lot of chicken wire. So in the image here that we have, we've got a beetroot on the left-hand side that's been um, planted out in its second year for seed production. And we have uh, overwintering crates on the right-hand side where the beetroot has spent its winter, which we will often wire up so that we don't have to uh, worry too much about um, 
rodents attacking the overwintering crops. So, seed quality, going back to the issue of seeds and matching this up with the issues of pests and diseases that we may have during this process. One of the things that uh, we would encourage you to do is to look at your seed um, to determine whether or not uh, any pests or diseases might be, uh, any diseases might be seed borne. And Having clean seed at the start of your growing season is really important because potentially the whole crop would have to be removed if you discover issues along the way. And that's another reason why we keep multiple generations of seed in the heritage seed library collection, so that we do have a backup for seed sown. And depending on what you're trying to do, whether you're developing your own bread varieties, uh, whether you're specialising in one or two particular cultivars that you want to grow for seed. Um, thinking ahead at this point, um, when there are potential issues with um, seed borne um, problems for your seed will help you prepare for that. So we don't have any kind of on-site um, testing facilities for our seed. And our main way of detecting whether there is a problem or not is using visual means. Um, and knowing what pests and diseases we have um, and through our, our integrated pest management plan. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, including things like uh, potential vectors for some of the issues that you might have in your seed. So whether or not it's a fungal, bacterial, or viral issue, um, the first thing we always do is look at the health of the seed that we've sown. An inspection of dry seed can detect um, some basic seedborne pathogens that you might find present. Um, often there's an indication on the seed coat itself, uh, and, and, but it's also very important to keep a good record of what has happened in the previous year if you're re-sowing seed that you've grown yourself, because there might be other reasons um, around wet, wet weather, for example, that might affect the quality of the seed that you're sowing. Um, for us, it, often it's uh, we're doing trial varieties, so we might not have seen the, the variety or its seed before. It might have been donated to us as a new variety to add to the collection and we have to be particularly cautious about that. Often an indicator of whether there is an issue with the seed, you'll see um, very soon when you start to grow it. It may well be that you have very low germination rates, even though the seed might not be very old at all. It might uh, have very poor vigour, it might not be growing correctly, um, it might look particularly unhealthy. Uh, and it might, you might have evidence of sort of twisted growth or very weak growth or brown patches on the leaves or yellow patches on or between the leaf veins, for example, or some other unusual things going on. Now, it can be very difficult to um, identify issues with the seed uh, visually, um, which is why you should um, perhaps consider investing in some um, flash kits for things like um, mosaic virus, um, or um, issues with particular types of crops like cucumber, melon, for example. Um, and again, the toolkit will direct you to resources where you can find out more information about accessing those. One of the things that we do, and I know that you've already um, uh, got access to information about integrated pest management plan, is that we um, would always encourage you to keep extremely close records on your growing year so you can have an idea of uh, any pests and disease issues that have, have occurred during the year. But when you have an uh, integrated pest management plan, we're organically certified, um, so we keep a close record. You can see on the right hand side, the very typical um, record that we keep to manage our crop growing each year. And that covers everything from the number of seeds that we've sown at the start of the year to get a, an idea of germination rates to any required re-sowing. So if a, a particular first batch of seed has failed or the germination rate is too low for the population requirement, then we've got that recorded right at the start of the year. Any additional notes about um, pests and diseases and interventions that we've used, that we've encountered along the way, is something that we would record as we go along. And we also keep a note of the final population size from which we've harvested our seed. All of these will help build up knowledge about the kinds of crops that you're growing. 
Um, so although we're pretty much at the early start of the growing season, and I know with the colder weather, some of us are a little behind on what we would expect to be growing, definitely now is the time to make sure that you've got your record keeping in place so that you can manage all of the issues and retrospectively assess the final harvest based on what's happened during that particular year. Um, certainly in terms of seed quality, being able to understand whether an issue on the seed coat is something that's happened during cultivation phase or whether it's something to do with the drying process or whether in fact you've encountered pests and diseases as a, uh, as part of your, of your growing year is really important to be able to look back on those records. Definitely something we can't do uh, without. Uh, and we have to trace the provenance of every generation of seed that we produce. Uh, uh, and again, another reason why we keep multiple batches and multiple generations of seed. So I'm only going to very briefly talk about storage um, because we'll be looking at this in a lot more detail when we get towards the uh, later webinars around seed harvesting and seed processing. Uh, and yes. Sorry, there's Sorry. a couple of questions on yeah. um, pest and diseases. John, did you want to ask your question? John was asking, asking, do you consider plants or fruits knocked out or back by pests and diseases as natural roguing? Take seed from those which survive or at least affected. Um, if we... Uh, uh, to, to some extent, we would it would depend on what that pest or disease issue is. Um, obviously, varieties that are, show certain resilience that have been developed over selection, you know, that, that will be uh, evidence of that. But you do have to be um, careful um, how you manage that because some, you know, you want to be very careful with things like blight, for example. Although they aren't seed borne, um, they could affect the rest of your crop if you're saving seed from them. So we would always encourage people to remove um, diseased or, or damaged plants, um, but, but, it, but it potentially it could, uh, you want to be shown evidence of, of resilience to some of those pests and diseases are going to be evident in the plants that remain. Um, I would be careful depending on the kind of crop issue or the kind of disease that you have, um, what that means. But there's some, some okay, if you've got evidence of a virus, for example, um, that's something that you would want to be extremely careful about and remove all of the affected plants um, and, and ensure you've got sufficient hygiene um, to make sure that that doesn't cause any issue with the rest of your population. Thank you, Katrina. That, that's it for uh, the time being. OK, I appreciate I'm kind of rattling through a huge amount of content in this course. So um, apologies if I'm not going into a huge amount of detail on all of these slides. But I hope it will give you a kind of overview, kind of pointer to uh, what you need to consider when you're growing, uh, your, when you're planning your growing for seed, not just um, at the start of your growing year, but all of the things that you need to consider when you're going through, through the, the growing season. Um, yeah, so just to return briefly to storage, um, as I mentioned, there are some things that um, you need to consider when you're uh, taking seed out of storage to sow, and we'll be talking later on more about how you process seed to put it into storage at the end of your harvesting year. Um, so you may be using frozen seed or you may, may be using cold store seed. Um, period of resting is always in, encouraged to ensure that, um, that the seed is at the optimum um, temperature for when you're sowing it. Um, we also need to consider things like um, hard seededness, particularly on peas. Um, and again, determining the germination rate on some of the crops that you use, it may well be that you want to be um, uh, using hot water treatments and um, uh, soaking things like peas to make sure that you're able to sow them. Again, um, we signpost to some of the um, considerations you need to have in the, in the toolkit resource for that particular, particular issue. <clears throat> and there are other things that you can do around the quality of the seed that you've got in your hand when you start to sow it. Uh, and we use a lot of germination testing, particularly on older seed, to get some idea of how many seeds we need to sow in order to ensure a suitable population size. So again, depending on what you're trying to do, if you are um, uh, testing the seed that you have for, for quality control, for viability, for distribution, um, then you're going to want a, a high percentage germination rate. Um, similarly, if you're testing seed that you've got in your store and you want to find out 
um, how much you need to sow for your, your population requirements. And then a spot check like this um, is something we do. We're doing a huge amount of this at the moment. So we're looking at our distribution seed um, to our members from our cold store. And there are, again, different ways of doing this. So we have a concertina method for larger seed. Essentially, what you're trying to do is create the um, natural germination conditions, so uh, warmer temperatures uh, and moisture. And um, a, a, a much smaller seed, then you have a, a higher um, seed count. Uh, generally, for, um, co uh, for commercial purposes, germination testing, we generally recommend germination testing 200 seeds in order to get um, a statistically um, significant result and repeating those if you if you wanted to um, back up that information on your collection. We have baseline germination tests for everything that we harvest at the end of the year, um, but we also do this to manage older seed in our collection um, at the start of the year as well. Um, it's also another way of pre-germinating seed um, just to uh, before you actually plant it out. So uh, we were going to look at some specific cultivation requirements for some of the crops that you may already be growing or considering growing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, peas and French beans first. And we've grouped them together because in terms of ease of seed production, um, they are very similar in terms of growing requirements. Um, they are both inbreeders, so if you remember from the first webinar we did um, on plant reproduction, both of these veg types are inbreeders with a, with a very low risk of cross-pollination. And peas and French beans, they should be grown pretty much in the same way as you would be growing them from an edible crop. And for peas, whether they are, uh, their culinary traditions are to eat as mange twos or uh, for dried seed or your, your traditional green um, podded pea, um, you're going to be growing them all through to their final uh, mature stage uh, for, for seed production, right through to the point at which they are, the, the pods are ready to harvest. The good news is that although they are inbreeders, and that means that they only need a very small population size, for something like peas, in order to ensure a genetically healthy gene pool, you only need about 10 plants. Obviously, you're going to be scaling that up depending on your harvesting requirements um, for, for commercial seed production. Um, similarly, for French beans, 20 plants is generally good enough for seed production. You might want to increase that for dwarf varieties where they're going to be producing fewer pods per plant. Um, but in terms of a healthy gene pool, you don't need an enormous um, population to start off with. Uh, which is why they're very often a very good place to start if you're right at the beginning of your journey for seed production. So for peas, they uh, will self-pollinate. Uh, they will self-pollinate when the flower has not even opened, so the likelihood of cross-pollination is pretty low. Um, the flower is usually tripped by um, wind, so you don't have to intervene in, it in any way. No need to obviously introduce pollinators at all. And commercial seed growers' recommendation is that you space different varieties of peas about 20 metres apart. Now, for us at the Heritage Seed Library, that's not something we generally worry about too much. We do grow them in polytunnels and we can often grow them side by side. Um, but obviously the main risk of growing them too close is that they will grow into each other. And although two pea varieties might be quite distinctive when they're at an immature phase, by the time they get to the kind of dry, crispy levels, as they are on the left-hand side there of the, of the slide, um, then it becomes much more difficult to separate them out. Um, which is why we're extremely vigilant in our labelling processes. So even if you're not spacing them 20 metres apart, please make sure that all your plants are accounted for and um, all the way through from sowing into harvest. It can be very difficult to unpick a dried pea from another variety. Um, for French beans, they will visit, insects will visit French beans and there is a slightly higher risk of cross-pollination. Sometimes there's evidence in the uh, back of the flowers where bees, for example, have drilled into the back and bitten into the back of the flowers in order to try and access um, the, the back of the flowers. And that as a consequence, it might be 
in their process of trying to access the nectar, they could potentially um, transfer pollen from another variety. If you're only growing one variety per year, it doesn't really matter, but if you're growing um, nearby other varieties, then obviously you need to keep an eye out for that. Um, caging is probably not necessary. Isolating um, by um, barriers of some kind is probably not necessary, uh, but we do recommend an isolation distance of at least 10 metres, for example, just to be on the safe side. In terms of the two principles for saving seed, um, ensuring that the um, we prevent cross-pollination and ensuring that we only save from the very best examples. Um, those two principles are pretty much covered already with peas and French beans. They don't readily cross-pollinate and because they are happy self-pollinators um, and inbreeders, there is often um, very little variability in your crop. They're usually pretty stable. Um, so in terms of roving out um, any atypical varieties, um, you may well find that there's not an awful lot that you need to remove. Obviously, if you do come across some that are uh, weaker than the others, um, as, as um, your questioner earlier asked, obviously take out those that aren't doing quite so well and take out any that are atypical. So we did have a variety of pea that we grew uh, a couple of years ago and um, although peas are pretty stable, we found that one particular variety was producing very speckled pods, for example. And although that was a minor feature of that um, particular cultivar, um, it was certainly not typical for, um, for, for that plant itself. So we roved it out. You can afford to do that with these population sizes because they're not necessarily very large, um, but always make sure that you're only saving seeds from the very best examples of those. Katrina, Alison has a question about carrots and distance from cow parsley and wild carrot. Yes, so uh, yes, carrots, and um, we'll be covering them in the next se session um, where we'll be looking at selection, which is particularly important for carrots. So uh, they're highly variable. So we need a bigger population size. Um, you're going to be selecting out an awful lot more. Yes, you do need to isolate them from uh, wild carrot types. Um, uh, and the isolation distance, I will check for you, but we always grow them um, completely undercover and we introduce pollinators ourselves. So if you are growing, um, if you are growing carrots, you do need to isolate them from, from uh, wild carrot varieties as well as other domestic crops that might be grown nearby. Uh, they will be visited by insects. Isolation distance, I'll come back to you. I'm not entirely sure and I will need to double check because we don't we don't uh, isolate by distance, we, we cover them, uh, but that is something that you need to consider. Um, and you may want to introduce pollinators, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in other sessions, but essentially we use blow fly flies in order to do that. So you may have heard me mention previously about how we buy in um, uh, angling maggots, swipes from um, fishing shops, and then introduce them uh, to pupate and emerge as flies to do that process for us. Um, but I will check the isolation distance for carrots and get back to you on that if that's okay. Any other questions from that? Okay. No, that's fine, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, so getting back to uh, peas and French beans, um, typical pests and diseases that we have to manage for them, uh, pea and bean weevil. Uh, and we talked briefly about evidence of um, uh, bean weevil, you might find at the start of the growing season that there's evidence of nibbling of the leaves, and, um, you get small sort of crescent shaped marks in the leaves. Uh, we generally tolerate this under an organic system, we don't need to worry about that, and generally plants will outgrow them. So if you're growing in modules, for example, or even if you're direct sowing, and you find evidence when you've planted them out of bean weevil, um, on the foliage, generally that's not an awful lot to worry about. Um, but you do need to worry about them when you're harvesting. And again, you, you need to look out for evidence of, of emerging seed. And we talked about freezing the seed for seven days um, if they're sufficiently dry enough in, a, in order to overcome that. Uh, pea moth, uh, that's something we experience occasionally um, on site, which is why we generally grow them under cover where we can. Um, you might find some small holes and a kind of powdery deposit um, around some of the seed. Um, 
they will continue to eat their way through your crops. So you do need to remove um, pods where there's evidence of that and seeds where there's evidence of that um, when you harvest. Um, the general way that we manage that is in timings of sowing. So we find that the pea moth generally is around um, sort of June, July onwards. So we do try and have uh, our harvest of peas much earlier in the year. So peas are one of the, the the early crops that we harvest, it's usually the first thing that comes through the door and we do try and um, sow quite early on in the year um, to make sure that the flowering happens before um, the, the worst part of the pea moth season. Another issue you might need to bear in mind is um, sclerotinia and mould uh, and again associated with kind of stuffy polytunnels that we use so very often we will cut back leafy foliage um, at certain times of the year for um, for particularly with our French beans when they've started to, to pod um, to ensure that we've got sufficient air circulation around them uh, and obviously remove any, any, any issues with the, uh, any foliage that is showing any evidence of, of issues. Yield, um, they will vary quite significantly depending on the variety that you're growing. And one thing to bear in mind, of course, is that if you're growing for seed and not um, to eat, uh, for things like French beans um, and peas, if you're not continuously picking, then you're not going to be stimulating the plants to produce more seed, uh, more flower and potentially more seed. Uh, and again, you need to think about whether you're growing dwarf varieties or climbing varieties, and the payoff being the amount of um, support structures you might have to put in place to, to produce the seed uh, with the quantity of seed that you will produce if you're just growing a dwarf variety. Tomatoes, again, another very pretty easy crop to grow for seed um, if you are right at the beginning of um, seed production uh, uh, in your experience. Again, they are happy self-pollinators generally, and um, most flower types will be the one on the top left-hand side here. So the um, stigma is completely enclosed. The flowers will happily self-pollinate. Um, and you only need a very low population size to ensure that you've got a good ge genetic um, pool for seed. So you only need six plants um, to ensure that, although obviously you'll want to scale that up um, depending on your seed production requirements. There are some exceptions uh, to the flower types and for some heritage varieties, they're often exposed to stigma, um, as you can see on the right hand photograph. Um, you just need to be careful that you don't have two exposed flower varieties growing at the same time. You might want to isolate them um, with caging of some kind or grow them in sex polytunnels, for example. Um, there can be some, um, some confusion with the, the flower types, particularly with first flowers on tomatoes. Often they can be more elaborate and exposed to stigma flower types, but we generally just pick them up and not worry about them too much. Um, Again, one thing to bear in mind is the variation in seed yield, depending on the cultivar that you're growing. And we find that often big beefsteak tomato variety plants will only produce a small number of fruit. And within those fruit, you may find that there are only a small number of seeds. Um, so again, thinking about how much um, seed you want to produce and the kinds of varieties you're interested in growing, you just need to kind of bear that in mind, really. You'll obviously want to maximise your fruit yield, whether you're growing for seed or, or for product. Um, and depending on the type of tomato that you're growing, whether it's a, a vine or cordon, an indeterminate type, um, or a, a bush or determinate type um, um, variety, there are different ways of managing the cultivation throughout the year. So for something like a bush tomato, they're going to produce multiple side shoots that will bear the fruit. Um, and you don't want to remove any of the side shoots because that will reduce the yield that you have. So really, other than supporting the plants, perhaps with some stakes, maybe up to a metre tall, um, they will happily produce um, fruit that you can then harvest uh, for seed. With indeterminate varieties, vine or cordon tomatoes, um, you have a bit more intervention that you need to bear in mind. So the fruit will, fruit will develop from uh, flower trusses, and those are the stalks that will grow on the main stem. Uh, you're going to have to support these because they will continue to, to grow and you want to be able to support and train them um, either along strings or um, with canes in order to support them. So you can see I've got two different pictures here. 
Uh, this one, this is supported with a cane, so the, the growing um, uh, plant is, is, is tied to the, the cane in the soil. Um, or you could maybe able to suspend um, string. And often we plant these out with a root ball. So we plant the bottom of the string into the ground with the, with the plant itself. Uh, and we help support it as it, it grows up to, to wrap around the, 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 the twine as it grows. Uh, you want to pinch out the side shoots for these kinds of tomatoes. Um, and that's between the main stem. Uh, once the leaves have got to at least six pairs of true, true leaves. Uh, depending on whether you're growing them inside or outside, um, you want to take perhaps take off the top truss uh, to stop it from growing any further. And for outside, you want to do that after you've got four trusses um, on your plant. And for inside, you want to do that when you've got six trusses on your, on your indoor plant. Again, saving seed from only the best examples, you want to remove anything that looks um, different, um, anything that's atypical, anything that is not growing very well uh, and looking quite sickly, so that you only save seed from the very best examples of the fruit that you produce later in the year. And finally, I'm going to quickly cover the kerbits. So they're all going to be fleshy fruits um, around the seed. And cucumbers and melons are obviously easily recognisable, um, but there can be some confusion over squashes. So we, uh, whether they're pumpkins or marrows or any other kinds of squashes, they're all um, the same genus cucurbita. And for convenience, we tend to, when it comes to seed production, talk them about them all here as squashes. So whether they're pipo or maxima or machata, um, we, we just refer to them as, as squash types. Um, summer squashes, things like courgettes, for example, um, often they eat at an immature stage, but for all of these fruit, you're gonna be growing them right along to that longest um, growing season that you can, you can for these to ensure that the fruits have fully matured um, in order to say, uh, produce the, the right seed from them. Um, generally, plants can be grown as you would uh, for a crop, um, for eating, um, but um, you want to make sure that you have a long enough growing season as possible in order to develop the fruits to full maturity. Um, if they're frost tend as they're frost uh, tender, you might want to consider growing them under protection uh, at the start of the year if you're growing them outside. Um, we always grow our crops in polytunnels, our, our squash crops, our cucurbits um, under cover in um, our polytunnels. And we certainly would recommend that, obviously, the case for things like melons um, um, definitely would only thrive in the UK under, under um, covered growing conditions for seed production purposes. Cucurbits generally less susceptible, we find, to some pests and diseases. But things like cucumber mosaic virus um, is something that you need to be aware of. Um, evidence of that can often be seen in kind of crumpled yellow or mottled leaves um, that, that may indicate that the virus is present and that can be seed borne. So you do need to consider that. Um, we would recommend obviously you destroy the plants uh, and also practice good hygiene in terms of making sure that your tools are clean, that you don't transfer any of the, the, the um, issues across. Pollination and isolation methods, um, depending on what you're uh, producing, that they are they have separate male and female flowers, and there are different methods that we can use to do that. I'm just going to pause slightly because I know my colleague Claire was hoping to be able to join the webinar. Um, would you be able to tell whether or not she's been able to 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 join this particular session? I am here. I don't know. Oh, there you are, Claire. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Sorry, I had a few, sorry, had a few technical issues, but I am here now. <laughs> oh, well done. Thank you, Claire. Um, I was going to um, talk to, to or introduce you into talking about what we do with our squash flowers on site. So we do grow them in polytunnels and we're not growing them outside as such. Did you want to kind of briefly talk through? I know you've got a few images here and it's, it's difficult to describe without actually having the, the vegetables in front of us and the flowers in front of us. But did you want to, would you be able to just briefly talk through some of the processes that we do for hand pollinating? Thanks. Yeah. So the, the first thing is really to identify which ones are male flowers 
and which ones are female flowers. So the female flowers will have, you'll see at the back of the flower, a swelling, which is the embryonic fruit. So it may look like the resultant squash, if you know what the squash is going to look like. And the male flower simply is just um, petals and a stamen. So that's the first thing to do to identify male and females. If you're doing it in a polytunnel, it's very simple because you don't need to isolate flowers. So you, the easiest way is to take the flowers, uh, to pick a male flower and to take the flower, the petals off the flower. So you're just left with the stamen and you'll see the pollen on it. And then to use the male flower to pollinate um, to find a female flower and then pollinate the inside. So you'll see the female structures and you just gently brush the stamen over the uh, structures in the female flower. Um, if you can mix it up as much as possible because they're outbreeders, that's really good. If there's a shortage of male flowers, you can use um, one male flower to pollinate multiple female flowers. But ideally you want to mix up as many of the male and female flowers as you can. If you're doing it outside, um, squash flowers open in the day and you need to pollinate them before 12 o'clock so you get better pollination rates. Um, and in order to isolate the flowers and stop them being pollinated before you pollinate them, you need to go out at dusk, if you can, and identify male and female flowers, tape them up um, with some sort of paper tape, so tape up the ends, and the way that you identify viable flowers is to look at the colour and the structure. So if there's if it's slightly green at the bottom but becoming orange at the tips and the flower is closed, it's more likely a, a viable flower. If the whole flower is orange and very wrinkled and crinkly, then it's gone past its viable stage. So once you've identified viable flowers, you take them both up, you come back in the morning and it's the same process really. So you untake the male flower and get that ready. Um, be aware of any bees that might be buzzing around and then find the female flowers, untake the petals and go through the same process of brushing, taking the petals off the male, male flower and brushing them on the female structures in the on the female flower. And then you close up the female flower quickly so you can't get any bees, uh, other bees coming in and pollinating it. And if you've been successful, uh, the embryonic fruit will start to swell as it's been fertilised and then the uh, flower will just fall off. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Claire. Um, and you'll see on the top left hand corner, hopefully you'll end up with um, a very uh, fine set of uh, ripened fruit. Um, to pick at the end of the growing season. As I mentioned before, you want to keep that as long as possible. And one of the things that we do do is bring in our harvested um, squashes to ripen up further um, for um, seed production purposes for another couple of weeks. So um, you'll be, for that particular variety, so that's long white trailing. In fact, when you eat it, it's going to be at kind of cool jet size. But by the time we harvested them last year, they were enormous, um, very hard coated, by the time we sort of seasoned them off for an additional couple of weeks inside before we harvested the seed. So again, something to bear in mind when you're um, planning the kind of time commitment and where you're going to store things at harvest um, for, for squashes is quite important. Um, melon and cucumber, uh, we know that they're a lot trickier to um, save seed from. I think it's fair enough to say that for uh, hand pollinating, um, our experience is that they will often reject hand pollinating for melons, for example. Um, so you might be, need to be more persistent in order to ensure success for, for pollination. You might end up with a, a single fruit per plant. And again, you need just to kind of bear that in mind in terms of um, your planning. Um, cucumbers is something that we've grown on site as well for seeds. And in terms of harvesting, you're going to be growing them well, well beyond um, the edible stage. Um, you want to keep them on the vine for as long as possible to ensure that, that they become overripe. Um, and there are different methods for um, then maturing them even further for seed. You want to leave them until they're largely going soft. Um, and we have left them until they've completely rotted. So we will have harvested them, brought them inside, 
um, and actually let them essentially um, break down completely. Um, I would suggest that you put them somewhere where they, uh, the weather smell won't bother you because they can smell quite strong. Um, but in order to then harvest the seeds afterwards, you will have given them the best um, option to um, produce mature seed um, for um, seed production purposes. Now, I'm very conscious that we have rattled through what is an enormous um, area, and we've tried to cover everything from uh, basic requirements around uh, pest and disease management and record keeping and germination testing, as well as looking at some of the specific cultivation requirements for these particular crops. So I'm going to kind of pause for breath for a moment and thank you for listening so patiently and really kind of open the floor to, to you um, for questions that you have either on the crops that we've covered or some of the overview issues that we've introduced to you or to talk about any of the crop requirements that you're growing at the moment. Um, Claire, I wasn't aware that you were in the background, uh, forgive me, do you, do, you, do you know offhand what the isolation distance might be for carrots? If not, no worries, we will go back and do some research. So as I explained, that's not something that we isolate by distance, but we'll come back with some content on that. Um, sorry, no, I don't know off the top of my head, so apologies, no, I don't. Yeah, don't worry, we'll come back to you on that and we'll we'll come back with a, an isolation um, distance. And we'll also come back with the list of wild relatives that you need to uh, worry about in terms of seed production for carrots as well. So uh, Katie, um, did you want to, were there any particular questions that uh, you wanted us to cover on, on this session? Um, or I'm happy to pick up any questions that have appeared in the chat box. There's a question from Alex, um, leak rust, does that transmit across to the seed? Uh, leak on the seed, I'm not sure. Claire, does that, is that a seed borne issue do, are you aware of? We might, again, we might need to go back and check that from, from the seed borne. Um, I, think, I think it's more about um, showing resistance when we were, someone asked a question at the beginning about um, resistance to pests and diseases. So I think we tend to select for leaks that if they show a lesser susceptibility to leak rust, just because it shows that they've got a greater resistance to, I think, more than it being transmitted, as far as I know, anyway, at least. Thanks, Claire. Sue, would you like to read your question out? Um, I was just wondering if you tested all your seeds at the same temperature, whether they're tomatoes or lettuce. Uh, so when, when you say tested, you mean... Also the vitality and so how? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, so germination testing, yeah. I'm with germination you. testing, yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we have a, an incubator here, uh, which is essentially like a, looks like a fridge, but does the opposite. And uh, there are specific um, um, temperature and um, other conditions associated with germination testing. So uh, it's uh, the uh, provide the sort of formal um, conditions for germination testing, but we kind of average them out. So each vegetable type might have a very specific um, temperature range, but generally you're talking about 20 degrees. And we generally set our incubator at 20 degrees centigrade um, in order to do, conduct our germination testing. So it's not something you need an incubator to do. Um, in fact, under lockdown, there was a huge amount of germination testing going on under people's beds because we couldn't get the um, incubator out to people. And we need to do a huge amount of germination testing as part of our growing plans and our distribution tests on our seed quality. Um, so it's very simple um, process. Um, you're essentially trying to mimic the germination process, of course. So uh, whatever temperature that would work well for germinating, and 20 degrees is a pretty good temperature for most things, um, you're going to try and create those um, conditions in which to do it. So we use uh, a lot of <laughs> takeaway trays and um, we have got some Petri dishes, but anything that's a surface that you can use um, a, a moisture paper um, to create a surface for your seed. In fact, the images that I showed earlier, we, we buy in um, 
industrial uh, filter paper for coffee machines because it's far cheaper than buying um, lab standard um, germination test paper. Obviously, it's not sterile, that's something to bear in mind. But if you are seeing evidence of fungal activity or pathogens, um, that may well be something to do with the paper rather than the seed that you need to worry about. But generally, what we're trying to get is a figure, a percentage rate for germination rates for our food. Um, we use, um, you can use cold boiled water um, as clean as possible in order to, to conduct the germination testing. Um, and whether you've got a large seed where concertina in your paper will help maintain that surface contact um, for adding moisture to your seed, or you might have them on a surface to do that. So if it's something else to bear in mind for germination testing is whether or not your germination test in light or dark conditions. So you mentioned lettuce seed, seed for example. Um, we germination test them outside our incubator because they will germinate in light, whereas other seed types, things like French beans, for example, would germinate in the dark. So again, it might be worth, uh, if, you, if you Google ITSA, I-T-S-A, um, you will find um, links to um, the very detailed germination requirements for different vegetable types. But as a general rule, lettuce, um, leeks, for example, will germinate in the light. Um, most other crop types will germinate in the dark and 20 degrees will generally uh, do it for all of those crop types. But we do have some less traditional crops in our collection, which require a bit more heat in order to germinate. So we've got things like um, um, kalu, uh, for example, um, or perhaps um, some of our chocha, for example, might prefer um, higher temperatures, but um, otherwise generally 20 degree will do that quite happily. Thank you. So are, are tomatoes, peas, peas and beans and, and uh, cucurbits the kinds of squashes that you are planning to grow this year or interested in growing this year? Um, or are there other crops um, that, that we can answer any questions on at the moment? I've stunned you into silence. Well, that's great. Everyone's quiet this evening. Everybody's quiet this evening. <laughs> Does anyone have any further questions? No. Well, what a great session. Thank you, Katrina. Um, and so nice to see so many of you uh, on um, this month's session again. Um, the, as I said before, the recording will be posted onto the Knowledge Hub and that you can find it there. And um, I did put in the chat earlier on that we do have um, an integrated pest and disease management network, which we've just launched um, two months ago. Um, and the link is in the chat if anyone did want to join that. And um, I will send an email out as well um, with some of the questions people were asking. Um, so thank you all for coming and we'll see you next month. That's great. Thank you very much for everyone. And uh, yeah, see you. And we'll be looking at um, selection in particular. So we'll be covering, revisiting some of the issues that we've raised, but lo looking also specifically at selection requirements and um, for things like the biennial crops, which we haven't covered today. So thank you.